Number one. My father passed away about five years ago, unexpectedly from a heart attack. And to say it was hard on my mother and I is an understatement. Our old house in Knoxville just didn't feel like a home anymore. About a year later, Mum and I made plans to take ourselves and our elderly dog Ace on a move further south. We were relocating to a small town about a half hour from Atlanta. Just a few days before we were slated to move, however, I had one of the most vivid dreams I've ever experienced. All that was within my dream was my bedroom, a picture-perfect recreation of the real thing. I sometimes wonder if I was in some sort of sleep paralysis state when it occurred. To further add to the dream's realness, in the middle of the night, the streetlights right across the street would illuminate through my window, creating a light reflection on my wall. In my dream, as I lay there, staring at the same reflection, I saw an orb of smoke fade in from the shadows. Goosebumps chilled across my skin as I lay there, panicked and afraid to move a muscle. Suddenly, the orb of smoke stopped moving and steadily hung in the light's reflection, as if it was staring at me. Without warning, it spoke to me in my dead father's voice. I'm sending someone to watch you, it said. Despite hearing my father's voice come from the orb, I was absolutely terrified of it. I didn't know why. I managed to squeak out a small reply. What? I whispered. The orb remained silent for a few moments, leaving an eerie silence in the voice's place. And just as quickly, it spoke to me one final time. Damn. Black. I woke up almost instantaneously, gasping for breath. The nightmare had chilled me to my core. I didn't know exactly what to make of it, especially those two final words. I chalked it up to maybe my dad wishing us well on our move, but at the time, I couldn't shake the feeling that it was some kind of warning. Within the next couple of weeks, my mother and I had moved out of Knoxville and headed down south to Georgia. She had managed to find a quaint little house for us. With only one or two neighbors down a gravel road in the middle of the woods, it was a nice fit for us. Probably the best reliever of all of the stresses that came with the move, however, was our new neighbor's cat. She was a petite, older, black cat that gravitated towards me almost instantly, and I treated her as if she was my own pet. I left a can of food out for her once or twice a week, and even if I didn't call out for her, when she saw me outside, she would always run up to me. She helped ease my tensions about moving to Knoxville, especially without Dad there with us. Less than a month into our new house, I awoke suddenly in the middle of the night to a faint coughing noise that sounded like it was coming from downstairs. One important thing to know is that our dog, Ace, has a collapsed trachea. He needs medicine to help calm the condition down, so I'm used to waking up in the middle of the night to give him his medicine. I walked downstairs from my bedroom to go and give it to him. But that's the thing, I couldn't find him anywhere in the house. He wasn't in his bed sleeping, he wasn't in the kitchen, he was nowhere to be found. I didn't check my mum's bedroom, however, as to avoid waking her up. Besides, I wouldn't have heard the coughing if he had been in there anyway, so I just let it be. That's when I heard the cough again, but it was coming from further away, as if from outside. I looked over at the side patio door leading out into the woodlands and realized I had forgotten to shut it. It was slightly ajar. Christ, I thought to myself, he got out. I immediately ran outside with a flashlight and started calling for my dog. Ace, Ace, I shouted into the neighboring trees. I heard another cough and shined my light in its direction. That time, the cough had echoed from down the gravel road. I swear, a path had never looked so terrifyingly desolate, but in that moment, I thought my dog was lost, so I chalked the fear of the gravel road down to Newhouse Jitters. I pressed onwards. Ace, come on boy, home's this way buddy. And that's when I heard it, the cough that I had been following, but this time, it didn't sound like the dry cough I'd been hearing before. Instead, the cough had slowly morphed into a low growl. 
I shined my light towards the new sound. There, up ahead, stood a bright red fox in the middle of the path. For a moment, I figured it was some kind of sick fox which I had mistaken for my dog. The whole time, as I was processing what I was seeing, it stared directly at me. Its eyes glowed from the light of my flashlight. However, our stare broke when it tilted its head to the right. I looked down at what it was staring at, and there she was. Our neighbor's little black cat, standing beside me. It was as if she had completely changed persona. She was no longer the happy, affectionate cat I had come to know. Instead, she had her back arched upright, every fiber of her hair standing at attention. The little cat uttered the lowest growl I have ever heard come out of a feline. I figured she was just scared of the fox, so I knelt down beside her, trying to coax her away. I didn't want the fox hurting her. No matter how many times I tried to coax her out of her fight mode, she wouldn't budge. Her stare remained unfazed. That's when I looked towards the direction of the fox once more. There wasn't a fox standing there anymore. Instead, in the exact same spot of that gravel road, there was a walking, rotting corpse of a roadkill coyote, slowly moving towards me. I took a step back, absolutely horrified of what I was seeing. Its jaw was hanging loose from its face. One of its eyes was stained red, and it wobbled back and forth as if it was desperately fighting pain. I rubbed my eyes out of disbelief, hoping I was imagining it, but it was still there when I opened my eyes. Despite the gruesome sight before us, our neighbor's black cat, in spite of how tiny she was, stood there and kept growling at the creature, holding her ground. Suddenly, the thing stopped. The creature had ceased its walking towards us. For a moment, it just stood there, glancing back and forth between myself and this little black cat that was trying to defend me. That's when I unmistakably heard this beast mutter two solemn words in a low, gravelly voice. Damn. Black. In a flash, the creature ran straight into the woods. I shined my flashlight in its direction, but it had completely vanished. Even the brush it had run through looked untouched. That's when the cat, still standing beside me, calmed herself down, almost as if nothing had happened. She rubbed herself up against my leg, returning to her normal, loving mood. Despite technically not being mine, I proceeded to scoop her up and run back to my house. Before heading upstairs with the little black cat snuggled up in my arms, I decided to poke my head into my mother's room. Laying on the floor, sound asleep, was Ace. He'd been in there the entire time. I quietly closed her door before bolting upstairs. I made sure that little cat slept with me in that bed all night. From the research I've done, I think I was almost the victim of some kind of skinwalker. It must have picked up on the sounds my dog sometimes makes late at night, knowing I'd likely come to his aid. For whatever reason, our neighbor's black cat had scared it so badly, it scrambled away. I haven't seen it since that night, maybe because the same cat still wanders around that gravel road late at night. Maybe it decided I just wasn't worth the trouble. Either way, whether I have my father to thank, or just pure luck, I leave a can of cat food out every single night for that little black cat. And the most ironic part of all, that cat's name is Halloween. Number two. I was traveling through America when this happened. I'd made it to Nevada and found myself in a bar in some small town. I ended up chatting with some random guy at the bar, telling him about where I was from and where I was headed. Told him that I'd be in town for a couple more days before moving on. As we were sitting there, sipping on our beers, a rough looking guy entered the bar. He looked like a typical biker that I'd seen in American movies. He had this long beard, bandana, shades, leather jacket. It was so stereotypical that I gave a little laugh when I saw him. 
The guy I was sat with gave me a real serious look. Hey, don't mess with the bikers, man. His tone was so serious that I stopped chuckling immediately. I didn't mean nothing by it, it's just that where I'm from, guys like that are rare beasts indeed. Well, the two of us sat there drinking for a little while longer before I said goodbye to the guy and headed back to my hotel. Anyway, next evening I went back to the same bar, I ended up talking with some other guys at the counter. They seemed friendly enough. This was twenty or so years ago, but I remember their names to this day. George and Steve, a couple of other out-of-towners. We spent a few good hours laughing and drinking together, just generally having a great time. All of a sudden, a group of six or seven of those bikers walked in. They all looked just like the guy from the night before. Same biker clothes, ragged look. Hard compadres, put it that way. I remembered the old guy's advice from the night before and decided to look away. Didn't want to make eye contact with them, just in case. Don't mess with the bikers, right? Well, George and Steve didn't get the memo. They started muttering under their breaths about how ridiculous those guys looked, how they were trying too hard to look cool or tough or whatever. One of the bikers comes up to the bar, stands right next to George's stool and orders a drink. That's when George started making fun of the guy, saying how he reeked of bad body odor. Well, he said this a little too loudly, and the biker heard him. What was that? The biker asked George, with the gravelly voice of a guy who smokes 40 a day. George had had a few drinks by this point, so rather than apologize, he went whole hog. <laughs> I said you stink worse than a fat guy's ass crack. You hear me that time, buddy? The biker just smirked at George, looked me and Steve over in the process. The barman handed the biker a bottle of beer. The biker took a couple of big chugs. Then, without warning, smashed the bottle over George's head. And that's when the other bikers moved in on us. They roughed Steve and I up pretty bad, but nowhere near as bad as George. The barman didn't even try and stop them. Either he was friends with these guys, or he was smart enough not to get in the bikers' way. They grabbed a hold of all three of us and took us outside. Steve and I could still walk, but they were just dragging George at this point. Alongside all of the motorbikes outside was a jeep. They led us over to it and threw us all in the back. My head was spinning at this point, and rather than be filled with panic, I just remember thinking how weird it was that these bikers had a jeep. Several of the bikers crammed themselves into the vehicle with us. The others rode alongside on their bikes as they drove us out to God knows where. After a long drive, the jeep came to a sudden stop. One of the bikers next to us opened the door. I looked out. We were in the desert. They kicked Steve and I out of the jeep, but left George inside, half conscious. All the bikers hopped back inside the vehicle. The driver rolled down his window. It was the guy George had made fun of. You should pick friends with better manners, he told us. Then, with George still inside the vehicle, they drove off into the night, kicking up dirt as they went. Steve and I walked for a couple of hours before we stumbled upon civilization again. We were dehydrated, exhausted, and in agony, but the first thing we did was find a phone and called the authorities. We told them everything we could, where we'd been, what had happened, and that George was still missing. Despite having so much information to give them though, the cops never contacted me to say they'd made any arrests or progress or anything. I never heard from them at all. I stayed in contact with Steve for a little while after this. He never did hear anything else about George. We figure he's out in that desert somewhere. Doubt he'll ever be found. Don't mess with the bikers, man. Number 3 This is a memory from my childhood that still chills me to this day. I've pieced the whole story together from what I can remember and what my family has told me. I'll try and keep it brief. Anyway, here's the story. 
I was young at the time, maybe only three or four years old, and my parents had taken me out to an amusement park for the day. Spent most of our time in the kiddie section with all the really tame rides, the kiddie attractions and that sort of thing. Now, I don't remember how I became separated from my parents, but according to them, they looked away for a split second and I was just gone, vanished into thin air. As you can imagine, they became erratic, screaming my name and running all over the place looking for me. My father ran up to one of the workers and told them I had disappeared. The worker sprang into action fast. They had all been thoroughly trained for such an incident. He immediately pulled out his radio and reported a Code Adam, or something like that. A code they used to report that a kid's gone missing. All of the exits were closed immediately, and nobody was allowed to leave the park. The most senior guy there came up to my parents. My mum and dad started telling them as much information about me as they could. About my hair, my clothes, but the senior guy told them to forget all about that. Look out for your daughter's eyes, he said, not her clothes. It soon became obvious why he said this to them. I was found five minutes later in one of the park's toilets with two women. One of them was shaving my head, and the other was changing me into boys' clothes. They were trying to disguise me and sneak me out of the park. If successful, they had likely planned on selling me. Luckily, I was found in time, and the women were apprehended so they couldn't do this sort of thing to another child again. No doubt I looked a little weird with a half-shaved head, but my parents were extremely relieved to see me and have me back in their arms. It's disgusting, the depths some people will sink to. To think how differently things could have ended up had the staff not been so professional. Number 4 This is something that happened to me a while back. I lived in Canberra at the time, and had just been out drinking with my buddies late one night at a local watering hole. The bar was close enough for me to walk home, but required me to go through a park. It was late, 1am to be exact, so I figured the park would be totally empty. I started walking through it. When I reached about the halfway point, I heard something coming from the woods that surrounded the park. It was something I didn't quite expect to hear. The sound of a baby crying. What the heck? Who was out in the woods with a baby at this hour? I stopped in my tracks and listened intently. The crying continued. It wouldn't let up. Didn't sound as if anyone was coming to comfort the baby at all. Like it was alone out there or something. I guess I'd watched too many horror movies or listened to too many scary stories on YouTube or something but my drunk mind went into overdrive, thinking that this was a freaky scenario. I got real paranoid and dashed through the park along the pathway, not going anywhere near the tree line. It was a shameful thing to have done, to not check if everything was okay with the crying baby, but I was young and stupid and selfish. Turns out, being young, stupid and selfish may have just saved my life. I later learned there had been a number of violent robberies and stabbings in that park, a few days after I heard the baby crying there, a man was apprehended in those woods. He'd been hiding in the trees, playing the sound of crying babies on his phone to lure people towards him. He had done it several times already. Once he had gotten them deeper into the woods, he attacked the people he tricked, stabbing them and robbing them. The guy literally had dozens of different tracks of babies crying and dogs whimpering on his phone, all for the purpose of luring people towards him. Talk about an evil trap. He was literally targeting the people with the biggest hearts. I felt ashamed at the time, but I'm damn glad I didn't investigate that crying noise. Hey guys, Lazy here, and thank you very much for listening. Well, I've been away for a while, but it's good to be back. Hope you all didn't miss me too much. Anyway guys, I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, remember to smash that like button or I'll smash you. 
And before we end, I'd like to say a huge thank you to Robin, who created the thumbnail for this video. I've left links to his work down in the description below, including his YouTube channel, so please go over there and check out his other stuff. He's a fantastic artist. I'd also like to give a huge shout out to my Patreons, especially my biggest supporters. Joshua Lindsay, Sieg, Kyle R, Embassify and Embassify 2, Martin Vatland, Gamma A, Kelly Rocco, Connor Lotham, Kelly Rocco again, Danny Elk, Darius Safai, Nadine, Mitchell Herrera, Sloan Crawford, Sarah Ramirez, Victor Javier Fonseca Ruiz, Maracruz Cadano, Anime Wimp, Crazy Mask Parade, James Labor, Procupidine Natter, Gina Valera, Philip Westra, Alex Greenshall, Monica Mendoza, Crawford K. McDonald, Marley Wright, and Ray Price Burton. Thank you guys so much for your support, it really helps the channel out. That about wraps things up for this episode, guys. Until next time, you all stay spooky. And remember, the best things happen in the dark.